Hey, welcome to our webinar. The Consumer Attorneys of California New Lawyers Division presents tips and tricks for navigating the job market in the COVID era. It's my pleasure to, in, it's, first of all, my name is Doug Brewer and I'm the NLD Chair this year for, the, um, for this division. And it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Bakshishian. Jonathan graduated from Pepperdine Law and is one of the founding partners of Ellison Bach. Jonathan represents clients all over California in areas of wrongful death, premise liability, products liability, and ca catastrophic injuries. Among his many accomplishments, Jonathan has been awarded the Rising Star Award consecutively from 2017 through 2020. Jonathan also published many legal articles that have been published by CALA, the CAOC, and the CEB, the largest avenue for legal literature, and much of his work has been approved for MCLE units. He has served on the CAOC board for three consecutive years, CNLD, and is currently the Los Angeles Law School Advisor for the New Lawyers. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, Doug. Uh, so today's presentation is focusing on navigating the job market through COVID. I know there's a lot of law school students who are pressured as far as dealing with the bar and doing law school now online that they have a lot of concerns about reaching out to the job market and securing a position with all the restrictions that are put in place with COVID. So today's seminar and the panel, we're gonna focus on tips and tricks for law school students to be able to find other solutions and alternatives in order to get the job positions that they're looking for. Uh, for our, our panelists, we're gonna start off with Mika Starr. It's Micah. Is, sorry, Micah Starr, who okay. is current president of Consumer Attorneys of California. Micah graduated from UC Hastings College of Law and is the founding owner of Liberty Law with offices in San Francisco and Oakland. Micah practices personal injury, antitrust law, and employment discrimination. In 2015, Micah was the recipient of the Street Fighter of the Year Award by COC and since 2005 has been the recipient of the Presidential Award of Merit. She has received numerous awards and has positions in many bar associations. Micah also publishes a variety of articles in legal magazines and has presented in dozens of seminars. Welcome, Micah. Thanks. Uh, second, we have Chris Dolan, who graduated from Georgetown Law and is the founding owner of Dolan Law, with offices in San Francisco, Oakland, and Los Angeles. Chris practices personal injury, employment law, elder abuse, and civil rights law. In 2010, he served as the president of COC, and in 2016, he served as the president of the San Francisco Trial Lawyers Association. Among many of his accomplishments, Chris was awarded the Trial Lawyer of the Year by COC and SFTLA. Chris has spoken at multiple California and national legal conferences. Welcome, Chris. Next, we have Mike Alder, who graduated from Louisiana State University Law School and is the founding owner of Alder Law with offices in Los Angeles. Mark, Mike practices personal injury and workers comp and is one of the top trial lawyers in Los Angeles. His firm has recovered over a billion dollars on behalf of his injured clients and has been named super lawyer from 2004 to the present. He was also the youngest lawyer to be named trial lawyer of the year by Consumer Attorney Association of Los Angeles. In 2012, he was a president of COC. Welcome Mike. Next, we have Keith Bremer, who graduated from Thomas Jefferson School of Law and is one of the founding partners of Bremer, White, Brown, and Mara, with offices in Los Angeles, San Diego, Oakland, Riverside, Denver, Reno, Phoenix, and Las Vegas. Keith practices business law, civil litigation, real estate, and construction law. He represents some of the largest Fortune 500 companies and has been editorialized in the New York Magazine, LA Times, LA Daily Journal, CNN, Fox, and many other networks. Among many of his achievements, Keith has been named super lawyer for 11 years in a row and was awarded with America's top 100, California's top 100, and Orange County's top 50 attorneys. Welcome, Keith. Next, we have Mary Fersh, graduated from Loyola Law and is a senior associate at Daniels, Fine, Israel, Schoenbach, and Lubavitz with offices in Los Angeles. Mary practices civil litigation, personal injury, general liability, business litigation, and real estate litigation. Her clients also include numerous Fortune 500 companies and some of the largest insurance companies. Among many of her accomplishments, Mary was awarded the Rising Star and is on the board for several associations, including LACBA and the Association of Southern California Defense Councils. Welcome, Mary. 
So one of the, the first concern I got from a lot of law school students is they hear from their mentors, their friends, their school, and everything. <clears throat> they got a network. Um, and networking has been very restricted due to COVID. Uh, so I'll start off with Michael. What are some of the ways that attorneys are trying to network now in this new era? Well, it's all remote, <clears throat> just like we're having this conference. And um, they're not just trying. I think we're uh, fairly successful at it. And it is something that everyone should include in their toolbox. So I have had a number of people uh, referring attorneys. Um, we're, we're growing and expanding. So we've been doing job interviews. Um, folks like the, the people attending here who are still in school that want internships or just to start to get to know people, they're all requesting um, 15 minute, 20 minute, half an hour Zoom meetings. I'm doing coffees in the morning um, a, a lot earlier than I normally would like to be up and <laughs> chatting about the law. But, um, you know, everyone on this panel understands the commitment we've all made <clears throat> to raising the next generation. And so I know that I am and, and I'm sure others are continuing to meet people that they've never met uh, through Zoom or Teams or whatever the, the avenue is. Um, and no one should be afraid to um, reach out and ask for some time. We, we understand the commitment um, that it takes. And so I know we'll all make ourselves available to answer questions. And there's a lot that can happen and you can really establish relationships. So everyone should, should reach out. It's fair to say that cold calling and cold emails, it still hasn't gone away. It's, it's still there and we're, attorneys are still responsive to those emails. Absolutely. Um, you know, if I were to add any additional advice, I think reaching out over social media, if you really want to get to one of the senior attorneys or the partner, um, is probably not the way to go. So call, leave a voicemail. If, you know, some people's offices are still <clears> closed and Maybe they don't have a service answering. Um, so leave a message um, and then find their email and reach out that way. But don't send a direct message on Instagram because we don't all yeah. always manage our own social media accounts. So it might not get to the right people. All right. uh, Chris, do you have any advice for, for the students up there in San Francisco? You're on mute, Dolan. A button my wife would like to have. Um, <clears throat> so there's some structured programs that people can take advantage of. For example, in San Francisco, we have a diversity fellowship that's set up to try to promote diversity within the plaintiff's bar. <clears throat> and they'll be taking applications for summer internships where people are paid a stipend and work with three different law firms throughout the summer. So that's an established program that I think people might be able to benefit from. Um, as far as getting into my office, I mean, I'll tell you, Mike asked me to hire a guy one time. Remember Adam Wax, who's now a superstar lawyer somewhere? Yep. Uh, fi find somebody who knows somebody. And, and that's, I mean, I've, Gary Dordick's kid worked for me, Dylan, who's a superstar, you know? And, and it's about people that you may know who may get you to somebody you know, because I don't check my email. I have somebody who does that for me. And you'd have to know somebody to get that email in front of me. I do know that for Keith Bremer, if you put a hundred dollar bill underneath the paperclip, that, that he will read the serial number and may call you back. But I think you really have to try to use the connections you know to get to people you know, whether it's professors, other lawyers, people at CAOC. And I'm glad to see the new lawyers division doing this. I don't know if you know, but I started this new lawyers division um, 10, 11 years ago. Oh, wow. It's, it's been great. We, we've had fortunate outreach to lots of law schools and are signing up law school students and definitely a large increase over the past couple of years. That's, a, that's amazing. Um, so mentioning Keith, Keith, I know you've, you've definitely hired a lot of law clerks and, and students um, while they're in their second or third year. And then you kind of, hopefully, if they, if they make the cut, they get hired as associates. Looking forward to the future, do you have any advice to, to these students? Yeah, well, we're definitely really proactive in the law clerk, uh, in, in hiring law clerks in all nine offices. We do recruiting on campus. We're at all the, the major schools in California. Um, I think that if anyone's interested after their first year, 
you know, I think emails are great to introduce yourself. I think short, sweet, to the point and say, I'm looking to hire, I'm super hungry. I mean, I'm looking for people that are really hungry, they're, they're creative, they think outside the box. I'm looking for personalities. Um, so if they step outside the box, they send an email and they're interested, I'm gonna forward that email up. I'm, I'm definitely a rung below uh, Chris. And so I am a peasant and I'm okay with reading my own emails, but I definitely always forward those on to the HR team. And if there's someone that catches my eye creatively, I say, let's get this person in the door. Uh, so we start with a law clerk program. If we love them, we try to keep them on. We try to incentivize them. We overpay them. Um, and then we're always hiring for associates. We're hiring right now in all nine offices from family law to business litigation to insurance defense. So it's a good market right now for students. I don't think they should have a problem if they are networking. I agree with Chris. If you know somebody, you have to take advantage of that situation to get an in. Uh, I think you should do that. But I think it's a great time to be a, a law student. There's a ton of great opportunities out there. Do you recommend them to reach out to you or is there someone at your office that we can uh, give some recommendation to reach out to? They can 100% send me an email and I'd be happy to upsell it to HR. We're always looking for great candidates. Right. I wanna just add to what Keith said. Hungry is important, but I think you have to have hungry and humble. You have to have people who really wanna do it, um, but understand that they're just starting the process. Right. And Mike, I know you also hire a lot of law clerks, especially from Loyola and Pepperdine and Southwest. Do you have any suggestions for them? Yeah, well, most of my candidates, I'm actually monitoring Chris's email, so I get all those. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, let me take a step back and just say kind of what I did, because you're talking about if you know somebody, then use that contact. And then I suspect people are like, yeah, but I don't know anybody, right? So let me tell you, what I would say was I didn't know anybody when I started. And I think all of us understand that every person in law school works, knows how to work hard, knows, is motivated, has ambition. I mean, everybody that comes to the webinar has all those qualities. But the issue is, you know, how do you stand out? And I think we all look for really two things, even more so than your class rank or whatever, and that's enthusiasm and proactivity, right? The ability to figure out what we want and give it to us without us having to bug you to, to give us what we want to figure that out. And so I, I think that the way that you get to know people is you show your enthusiasm and your proactivity. And understand, I believe in two, two things, is one, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And everything that you want is usually right outside your comfort zone. And so it's uncomfortable to ask somebody that's a, you know, like these people that are like big deals, they'll never talk to me, they'll never answer my, I did the same thing. And what I did was when I was young, I wrote a personal note, to every president of Cala, period. And I said three things. You're awesome. Two, I'm hungry and I want to learn. Three, can I take you to coffee? Can I go to lunch with you and just sit down and listen to you? And I was like, nobody's going to answer. You know what? I had lunch with Brown Green. I had lunch with Bruce Braylett. I had lunch with all of these giants. And they taught me. But they also gave me permission to use your name to use their name. So then I would call somebody I wanted to get an interview with. I said, Brown Green recommended that I call you. How did I do that? I got outside my comfort zone and got over myself and said, so nobody's ever called me and said, stop writing me notes. Stop bugging me. Stop sending me emails. Never happened. So I would say that enthusiasm, that proactivity, Take shots. Failure is not an identity. If you don't get a response, it's just an event and get to work. And that's great. And I love that because it totally hits on our theme for today's seminar is that even though COVID's around, there's still other ways to do everything from marketing, networking, meeting people, reaching out, all the old school methods. They're flawless. They were great. Uh, attorneys, uh, you're hearing some of the biggest attorneys on this webinar. Uh, saying that they they will check their email at some point, they will respond, and they are willing to meet with you, and that that's that's a really great story to share. 
And um, Mary, I had the fortunate opportunity to attend a boda with you and we, we had a chance to network with a lot of other great students. Uh, but with those kind of seminars not being in place so much for these law school students, what do you recommend for, for the students in your area? Absolutely. Well, I would just first say that clearly you can tell networking is so important because you can get a job just purely from networking. So, I mean, definitely it's important to not only getting a job, but, you know, I would tailor it to what you want to do. So if you're trying to get a big law firm job, if you're trying to get a job at a plaintiff's firm, figure out what you want to do and tailor your networking to those people. If you know, you don't feel comfortable sending an email to the founding partner of the firm. See if there is a senior associate at the firm that maybe was an alumni of your school and reach out to those people and start with them and then work your way up to uh, the Mike Alders and the Chris Dolans of the world. Um, but absolutely, the Aboda Fellowship is a huge, uh, huge thing that law students should look into. That's the American Board of Trial Advocates Post Bar Fellowship. And essentially that fellowship is all networking. So it's a huge, it's a hugely important skill to learn and to hone and um, it can really get you that job. Especially at this point in time in COVID when we're networking remotely, look into seminars like this or look into the Los Angeles County Bar Association, which has free membership, and they specifically have networking events that target young lawyers and law students. Um, so be proactive and look for those opportunities. Um, for seminars, I mean, reach out to the panelists at, on seminars that you attend and network with them, and maybe they'll give you a job. Awesome. Well Speak, well, looking for a job before COVID, we all have these uh, little standards and stuff that we're looking for in, in students when we interview them. And now that we're in this COVID area, is there anything extra or additional or special that we're looking in some applicants uh, that we would want them to you know, put on their resume or something additional that we want now that we are in a COVID era? Um, Micah, do you have anything to suggest to these students? Um, I, I, I don't. I think we're, we're looking what we've, for what we've always been looking for, and there are a lot of firms hiring. I'll tell you, we're looking to expand. I know a number of firms in California on the plaintiff's side who, it, it's like the right case that comes along. We turn down a lot of cases uh, in, in our day, but we're not going to turn down the clear liability big damages case. There's always time for that case, right? So there's always room for a superstar um, applicant. And um, not only that, but, but a lot of us, when COVID hit, instead of shrinking and, um, you know, pulling the covers over our head, we pivoted and thought, what can we do to um, provide comfort and security for the team that we have? And how can we bring in reinforcements as people are going to have to be dealing with different struggles. They've, we've got people at home who have children who they have to make sure are being educated. And so we, we necessarily need to reinforce our own foundations. Um, but the skill set uh, is, is, is the same. As I said earlier, it's hungry and humble. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for volunteers, not hostages, right? People who wake up every day, and I tell applicants, I wake up every day and I think, how can I burn down the patriarchy today? So if you are in alignment with the mission of my firm and what we do, which is primarily child sex abuse cases, civil rape cases, and sexual harassment, uh, and gender-related employment cases, then we want you. But you've gotta be um, in alignment with our core vision. So get to know where you're applying. If you can take a look at our website or our social media account and you know exactly who I am, I am not shy about mm -hmm. why we do what we do. So if, if in your cover email or the text message or however you're communicating, if you let that person know, I see you, I understand the mission of your firm, it's also my personal mission or work I wanna do and here's why, um, that will set you above. I had an interview uh, over the weekend and I asked the person what, uh, which of our practice areas was most interesting and the person told me that they had not looked at our website. 
Mm. So, you know, that's when the phone connection gets really spotty. I can't quite hear you anymore. Um, do your homework. Yeah, definitely, definitely do the research before reaching out to any, any attorney or any law firm. Definitely agree. Uh, Chris, are you, are you looking for anything specific now that we're in this post-COVID era? Well, I'll tell you one of the things that we look for is, have you shown commitment to what we do? And specifically, have you taken trial advocacy? You know, have you been involved in a, in a mock court program? Because see, we're trial lawyers, we're not just lawyers. All of us on this group here try cases. So if you're coming out of a school and you've been on the trial ad team and you, you, know, you did well in trial advocacy and that motivated you, great. Uh, if you have volunteered somewhere and been to trial, great. Because it, like Micah said a moment ago, if you're not in our wheelhouse and you don't embrace what we embrace, we're not opening the door for you. So I, I think that is something that's important. Uh, other thing I will tell you is watch out for what I call the uh, present day job cycle, which means I see resumes where people have been somewhere one year, you know, two years, six months, and when you see those things, for me, it's a huge red flag. I don't want to hire people who are going to come and go. It's telling me, A, there's a problem with this person, or B, they're not focused. Uh, and so that's a big red flag to me. So if you've got a job, you're not in the dot-com business. We invest a lot of time, money, and energy in training you and getting to know our cases. So I'm not going to invest in that person if they're, um, they're bouncing around a lot. So I, I will tell you, as Micah did, how you can get to, we have five clerkships that we offer every summer, five or six clerkships. We have two in LA and one in Oakland and two or three in San Francisco. And if you send a resume to my office manager, Daniel Tavares, they'll put you into that group, but you should start looking for those internships now because they're gonna be scarce and long. And like Keith said, he's got a big program where he brings people through it and he's training them how to be trial lawyers as well. So I, what I tell you to look for, um, what we're looking for is people who are by nature trial lawyers. Yeah. So, Keith, with, with such a large pool with so many different offices, is there anything students can do to stand out in this, in this era? I agree with what everyone has said. I mean, look, you definitely need to do your homework. There's nothing more annoying when somebody comes in and they know very little about us. They definitely, need to know what we do, where we're doing it, what our objectives are and our goals. Like Micah said, I mean, we're very transparent on what we're trying to do. We're a creative firm. We have different segments. So, you know, we run ads for the different segments, family law, business litigation, insurance defense, trial work, et cetera. Um, I love what Mike said. We want enthusiasm. We want people that are hungry. I care more about your persona and your preparation for that uh, meeting, then I care about your class ranking. I want to know that you're going to fit into our culture. Culture is a really big deal for us. You know, we want everyone to go. Then I agree with the last point that Chris made is huge. We want people who are going to be committed and loyal to the firm. We spend an enormous amount of money in the clerkship program and we overpay because we want them to stay with us. We want them to love the culture. We want them to buy off on what we're trying to do long term. So we want people who are going to be loyal and they're not going to jump around. Uh, we spend a lot of time training, educating, continuing education. Uh, shadowing. I mean, I want them to be amazing. Now, look, if I'm happy and I tell them, if you commit to being here two, three years, I'm really happy. After that, if I'm not treating you well, you should leave me. So that's what I'm looking for. And I'm pretty transparent about it. That's great. That's some great advice. Mike, do you have anything to add on? Sure. Um, a bunch of stuff. <laughs> uh, okay. Resumes. You know, when I get a resume and I'm not looking or I'm not going to hire somebody, I will, as much as I can, reach out to that person and say, your resume sucks, let me help you fix it, right? And I don't say sucks, I just say there's, you know, I don't have a spot, but let me tell you, and here's just some stuff to think about, okay? If you're applying to a plaintiff's trial firm or a defense trial firm, don't lead with you are the editor of the entertainment law review. It just, right, <laughs> don't lead with that, right? If you are bilingual, don't put it at the last thing. Bilingual is a big deal for a lot of people if you can communicate in different languages. So I have looked at resumes and I've changed it. I don't need to know what your address is and your class rank. I'd rather know that you're a student member of Cala COC, you uh, volunteer at what, and you're bilingual. 
and you're a moot, you know, mock moot court. So think about who you're talking to. That requires you to look us up. You know, I think about people that I've hired. One, I hired a kid um, a long time ago. And how did I see him? He kept showing up at my trials. And after like my third trial, I'm like, dude, who the hell are you? And he was a law student that just followed me. I hired him, hired another person. They came to the booth that I had at the Vegas convention like 11 times. And I was like, but what does that show us? Right? That has nothing to do with your class rank. It has nothing to do with where you went to the school. It shows that you want it, that you understand what's important to us. And if you understand what's important to us, then we understand that you're important to us. So look us up. You know, I had somebody who quoted a book that I had made a reference to. I was like, son of a bitch. You look me up. You saw I like this book. You read the book and you sold me something that told me you read the book. That's a person I want to work with. Right. So what does that mean, though? Oh, that's a lot of work. Well. It's not about working hard. It's about doing the hard work like that that is required it's up to you. Yeah, I definitely agree. Commitment and dedication are, are great things that we want in, in these applicants and highlighting these key features of bilingual and being members of all these associations is definitely a great thing to have. Uh, Mary, do you have anything to recommend for, for the students out here in LA? Well, I would say that, you know, it depends on who you're interviewing with. So you're going to talk to Mike Alder differently than you're going to talk to an associate if you're interviewing with multiple people in a firm. So for example, with Mr. Alder, you might want to ask him about his last biggest verdict, you know, but if you're interviewing with me, you might want to ask me about my workload or what kind of experience I'm getting. Um, and don't ask, you know, what the work life balance is like, because although that's a valid question to me, you're telling me you're not going to be working all that hard and I'm in the office, you know, constantly and I'm, I'm going to need your help. So, you know, tailor your questions and your interview comments to the person that you're interviewing with. Um, also, I would just say be flexible because a lot of law students want to have that job before they graduate. And you don't necessarily need that. You can still get a job after you graduate, after you pass the bar, and you may be making more money than the, you know, your classmates who had secured jobs before they passed the bar and they felt, you know, more secure in that. So, I would say don't worry about it. Just continue your networking and that job will be there for you, especially after you pass the bar. You're so much more um, marketable and, you know, employers really want attorneys that can step right in there, get into court and do stuff for them. So that's what I would say. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Uh, if I could just jump in real quick here. We have a question from a student. The question is, apart from humility and hunger, what can a 1L student do specifically to stand out? Um, for me and our practice areas, um, volunteer somewhere. Volunteer at a child advocacy center or a rape crisis center or something that's within, you know, the, the bandwidth of what we're doing. Uh, if you have um, any sort of trauma-informed training for my office, I'm immediately going to gravitate towards you because you're going to know how to talk to our civil rape case clients without triggering their PTSD. I mean, that's that's a huge, um, uh, you know, thumbs up from mm -hmm. us. And the other thing is, I come from a political background. Before I went to law school, I worked in politics. So anyone who has any political experience, I feel like I know how they were raised. I know what their work ethic is. I know they know how to be front facing and deal with high stakes, high pressure. So if you've got political campaign experience, you've worked on the Hill. Um, but again, that goes back to Mike's point, get to know the office and get to know the job that you want and then figure out how to build that kind of experience. I just hired a junior um, associate who didn't have all of the boxes checked um, but he did his homework so extensively, he listened to like every podcast I've ever done. <laughs> and during the interview process, let me know that he really got what we did. 
it, this is Chris. I just want to jump in on something. I'll tell you the questions that I ask people when they come in to interview. And I think it, it kind of ties in with what Keith's saying. Do you know anyone who's ever lived in a mobile home? What is the shittiest car you've ever owned? What is the, what is the shittiest job you've ever had? And if you tell me the worst car I ever drove was my dad's old Ferrari, I don't know what a motor home is. And uh, you know, the worst job I ever had was um, filing papers in my father's medical office. Well, I gotta tell you, that's not going to be person I wanna work with because the people I represent live in motor homes, drive shitty cars and have difficult jobs. That's humanity, that's just who we are. I mean, I'll, I'll answer those questions for you. The shittiest job I ever had was I shoveled shit. I shoveled horse manure in 98 degree heat. The worst car I ever had was a Chevy C10 with, a be with a, just a front body 10 years old and I stole the lumber and built a back on it. And I have friends who live in mobile homes and my kids go over and play at their houses. So I would be careful about trying to seem too highbrow when you're coming along talking to a plaintiff's firm. You know, if you tell me you went to Harvard, I don't know if you can tie your shoes. Uh, so some of these experiences that show grit I think make a difference to me at least. I wanna know that I've got a, a, a fighter who's willing to get in there, who's had to work for every goddamn thing they have, and I have. That's good, those are, those are great. But I find it in this era a little bit harder to kind of get to meet these people. And these, uh, these interviews that I've had for our firm, I've seen that the, the new nice suit and the new nice haircut is actually technology. So I sometimes even ask some people, some students, some interviews, uh, what kind of laptop do you have? Do you have good connection? Because uh, with everything kind of moving to more remote desktop or working from home, I want to make sure they have good Wi-Fi, possibly a backdrop with lighting, good, good connection, so they can kind of still work for us uh, and, and do their work from home until things get a little bit better. Um, so something that our firm really looks for in these resumes is, it's good technology, good good computers, laptops, software, subscriptions to Microsoft Word, Adobe, and stuff like that to kind of give us the notion that you're ready to work remotely and adapt to the new conditions. And hopefully when things get better, we can take you back to our office. Uh, but a big concern I've seen from a lot of these students is they're very worried because of COVID, even though a lot of firms are trying to expand and get bigger, a lot of firms are also downsizing. Uh, they're also getting rid of some employees due to, you know, financial reasons or other, other reasons as well. Um, and it's been quite difficult for them. Uh, do you guys have any, any thoughts on, on the response to firms downsizing or getting bigger in response to COVID? And what can we recommend to these law school students to look out for and things they can do to kind of get advanced ahead of that? Well, this is Keith. I guess I wouldn't apply to firms that are downsizing. That would be a pretty tough hill to climb. I think I look for firms that are hiring and uh, I'm going to stick with my theme. I mean, I, I want people that are super hungry. I want that's first and foremost what I want. I mean, I, I'm with Chris. I came from the crappiest of crappy backgrounds. I went to the worst of the worst law school and I worked harder than anybody around me. Um, and so I want people who are committed and loyal to the process. Um, I want people that show up to the interview that are prepared for the interview and know the interview. We're prepared for them. So just so you know, we have a complete system on how we interview. We show them certain offices. We show them our culture and what we're trying to create. We let them meet a partner. Then we let them meet an associate so they can ask whatever questions they want. We're very prepared for them and that we want them to know that we care about them from day one, that we're creating something. In the same breath, they need to come in and be just as prepared. And the associate that walks in that isn't prepared, that doesn't bring a yellow pad, that isn't taking a note, that doesn't know something about me or the firm or the culture, or our growth or our diversification, they're not gonna get a job here. Yeah, Keith, are you, is your firm doing in-person interviews now or is it still on Zoom? Again, I want a guy begging to meet me. I want a guy saying, I wanna come in there. I, I don't care if you've got, you know, the, fi the, the, the building's on fire, I'll come in there and meet you. Look, at, I'm happy to do a Zoom interview, but it's the guy that says, I wanna come in, I wanna meet you for a coffee face-to-face. -face. Um, I just, I think that's important right now. You know, we're super cautious in terms of six foot distancing, wearing a mask when you leave your office. Um, I, I want people to, to say they want to come in and meet me. I, I don't know if that's politically correct, but I guess I want to be honest. Well, I, I agree. I, th I think that's important. We make it as difficult as possible um, to hire people. So we have very um, strict 
things that they have to do. And if they don't do them in the application process, we just reject them. It doesn't matter how great they are. So I would say read and follow instructions. We then start with a telephone interview. If they get past that, we do a Zoom interview and then we see how things go. But I, um, part of keeping the firm culture in existence during this, you know, the great pause we're in is being in the office some um, so you can continue to have a culture and build camaraderie and, and teamwork. Just so you know, Keith, we can still see you. Um, <laughs> um, and, and I've been thinking about this because I had uh, an experience with someone recently who negotiated really, really hard on salary. And um, it, 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 that's, you know, on the one hand, you want people who are going to take the initiative and negotiate. On the other hand, what I can tell you from the employer's perspective is that if you feel like, because we, like Keith, we always try to overpay for the right people and to keep them happy. And there is more money there usually for bonuses and whatever else, because you're going to reward the superstars. But when you negotiate hard, I think as an employer, you're always watching that person and measuring where they are if you feel like you're overpaying them. So if you're gonna do that, you better bring it. And I've seen it happen time and time again, and you don't, the last thing you want in a new job is to have your boss be kind of second guessing or watching or monitoring to make sure they made the right purchasing decision. Thank you. Uh, John, we do have another question from the audience here. Should I jump in and ask it? Okay, it's from Arthur. It's an international law question. This is an interesting question. It says, what would you recommend to a Canadian who would like to relocate to California to work at a plaintiff injury law firm? What would be the best way around this? In the past, I haven't had much luck in getting a successful application across. Well, first of all, I've got to wonder why the hell do you want to come to California or the United States when we've got a Cheeto in chief? I mean, I'm just questioning your judgment already. But if, if, if really what you're looking for is an experience, you've got to convince me that you actually have studied a law that I do, because maybe you have studied torts, but I know in Canada, there's a different system as it relates to who pays for the litigation, uh, what you can get out of the litigation. So you've got a hurdle to overcome unless you've already developed or got an LLM or a US degree, you've got a hurdle to overcome because remember, we're talking about investing and training and teaching. And, and if you're one step behind that already, then you're gonna to need to acknowledge that. And you may not come in as an associate, you may come in as a paralegal, you may have to demonstrate that you can learn the law because otherwise I'm not going to pay you to learn something that I can pay somebody who already knows it. It's just an unfortunate reality uh, of where things are. Or go work at some public interest firm, that would gather my attention. Like if you're an employment lawyer, go work in, in you know, something like La Raza or, or Instituto Laboral and go work or go work in um, the department, like Fair Employment and Housing. Show me that you're invested in it and that you've learned something there. Otherwise, I mean, if I've got you sitting next to somebody who has gone to a, a school in the United States who's on the mock trial team and who's done very well and worked for a plaintiff's firm, you've got a hurdle that I don't think you're gonna overcome with me. Interesting. I, I'm much I, harsher, I, I, just so you know, I'm much harsher. Then Mike comes on and, and um, ever since I've met him, I've called him the preacher because he's just got such a great way about him. You know what, Canadian, just come give me a hug. Come on now. No, uh, let me say this can't cheat yourself. That question already told me that you feel like being from Canada is a big negative. Is there anything that, so let me ask you this. Think about, can't cheat yourself. Are your cover letters blanket emails that say the same stuff? If you think that being Canadian has been a big issue, do you address that up front? Is there any way that maybe being a Canadian is a positive that you could say that this expands your potential firm horizon? But then like Chris is saying, you got to show you want it. Dude, I'll be a paralegal and show you the first three months that I can do everything that it takes. And in three months, all I need is just your 
you will evaluate and reevaluate. And if I don't prove it, I'm out. I'll do, I'll make the coffee and I'll file the lawsuit. I'll do whatever. That's the point. My first job when I moved here from Louisiana, I accepted before he told me how much it paid. He goes, don't you want to? I'm like, ah, I need a job. I work for your ass, right? And then I'll make it work. And I'm not saying do that. <laughs> it's not necessarily the best advice. But what did it show? Yeah, right. Chris is like, I work for you. Come over. But what does it show? It shows that I want to work, right? And the last thing I'll say is when people are asking, what, are, what do you want? Don't say, well, at some point I want to open my own firm and I want to take over the world. It's like, no, that means you're leaving in two years, right? Do not say that. Say, I am just here to do everything, anything, you name it. I will bleed on the table because this is where I want to learn. This is how I want to help clients. And this is what I want to do. And know who you're interviewing with and talk about it. That will come through. So being from Canada is just as much a potential positive as a negative. You're looking at it as a negative, but explain it. Yeah, there's also... Can I get an amen? <laughs> Amen. There's also a lot of other. Amen, brother Mike. Amen. There's also some great ways to get experience, even from out there in Canada. We have the COSC has webinars now almost every day on different subjects, from filing a lawsuit to doing motions to dealing with clients, doing intake. You can get all that kind of experience that you would typically get in a law firm um, on webinars. And those are great things that you can participate on a day-to-day -day basis or on a weekly basis, get that experience, take notes from these webinars. And in some ways, those webinars can serve as an internship or an externship. I know one of the biggest concerns law school students are having now is that they can't extern for a judge. They can't intern at a lot of these places, especially these government entities. They're just not really hiring anyone right now. And these students are scared that they don't have anything to add to their, to their resume. Um, and I've always proposed to them that we live in an even better era now because everyone's doing webinars on great topics with some of the greatest attorneys in, in California on subjects that are, <clears throat> that are super important. You can only learn so much in law school. And then on these webinars, you're learning a lot of practical skills on how to actually do the complaint, actually do the motion, understand deadlines, how to do an intake, how to talk to clients, some great skills that you can get as law school students who are concerned about experience and anyone who is international that's not in California. Uh, so anyone say one other thing, use the internet, man. Search for somebody who's a lawyer who went to your law school who's already done what you're trying to do. Uh, maybe she's found that path. Maybe she'll see something in you that'll say, I see myself in somebody. And I'll tell you, that's a lot of what everybody's saying here. They really are. Mike is saying, I want, to, I want to see if you've gone out and committed to this. You know, Bremer is saying, I want to see if you're hungry. You hear, you hear from Mary, you got to know that you're going to work hard. Uh, and the thing that I would say is look to try to find something in common that you have with somebody else and look for a Canadian lawyer who's made that, that jump, you know? And then finally, what I, you know, I, I'm sounding like I'm very unavailable. <clears throat> Bremer gets pissed because I don't call him back, but I've been very good at it lately. Uh, I would say to you that the best way to actually get your face in front of me is to call one of my associates and take them out to lunch. Because if they're impressed with you, then you're going to move into a much better spot. I, I'm not as accessible because I'm traveling all the time. Uh, but talking to them, that's the way a lot of people have gotten employed at our office, that and clerkships. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jonathan. This is Paul. Uh, we have a uh, uh, attendee, Boris, who has a question. So I'm gonna, if it's all right with you, uh, allow him to talk. Okay. All right, Boris, please go ahead. I have a quick question. Um, how do you compete with experience? Being a law student or somebody who's about to recently graduate, how do you keep, compete with someone that has the experience and they've been furloughed or laid off from a previous firm? How, how do you deal with that? <laughs> Uh, build, build up your resume, build up the, the experience and have an explanation. Um, one of the comments that one of the panelists said is if, if we see you going from firm to firm, it's usually a red flag. So if there is a short period that you worked at a firm, make sure you address that at the top of your cover letter and say, 
you know, you, you had a, a good position and to un unforeseen circumstances, you're no longer employed over there, um, but you're willing to, you know, take on a new job, a new position, take on all your skills. And in the meanwhile, while you're waiting for a new job, you're still trying to build your skills, whether it's with these seminars or, you know, doing research on Westlaw. There's also some uh, great websites that actually record trials. They record hearings and motion hearings, and you have a chance to actually, from home, sit down and actually watch these trials, uh, learn how to admit evidence, do cost examination, direct examination, learn uh, more deposition skills. And when you're watching these motions, you'll understand you know, how, to, how to speak to the judges, how to address the courtroom, um, and you learn more skills for your demeanor. Um, so if you've recently been laid off, the best thing to do is, of course, address it in your cover letter. And in the meantime, still build up your skills in any way you possibly can and boost up your resume. And I would, I would add to that and say that, you know, it's not necessarily a negative to not have the experience, but to be, an in, you know, having just graduated or be a law student versus someone that has experience but was recently laid off. Because first of all, you're gonna be cheaper than that other person. And you know there may be reasons why you are um, a better candidate than that other person. So like they're saying, build up your resume um, and build up your resume with things that are tailored to what you wanna do. And then I also wanted to add that in terms of, even though some judges are not having um, externs and that sort of thing right now. There are some judges and some courts that are doing remote extern programs, such as the California Court of Appeal. Their summer program this past year was entirely remote, so they're probably going to do the same thing next year. And if you can reach out to individual judges, I would think that they would do a remote program for you as well and just do it over Zoom and have you, you know, look into what they're doing. Um, via Zoom. So again, it goes back to networking. And if you can get those connections with those judges, or even with certain attorneys, they'll create a remote program for you, even if one didn't exist before. We do have one final question. I know we're short on time. Perhaps we can address it here. This question is from Stephen. He says, putting the previous answer aside about humility, drive, doing homework about the firm, is there any technical know-how that a 1L or 2L student could do to demonstrate they know in advance to set themselves apart? Can you do electronic discovery? I mean, if you really want to be unique, go take a course in how to do electronic discovery to go through computers and find things because I don't know how to do it. And there are courses out there that teach people how to do electronic discovery. That would be one of my tips. Uh, for me, I mean, look, I, like I said, I came from the School of Hard Knocks. So, I mean, I think these, they should get a job in a law firm, a file clerk. I mean, know where the brooms are to know how to clean up the bigger picture, right? Start as a file clerk and then move your way up to law clerk. But I'm looking for people who have tried to touch the profession, be in there. They, they can't get enough of it. And so I think that's what a 1L can do for, for me. I also wanted to pitch Justice HQ. They have an office downtown LA. If anyone on this call is interested in trying to meet some young attorneys, um, I'm happy to introduce them. Uh, you send me an email, uh, the downtown office is open. If they wanna come in there, there's always people in there and they can talk to some people, so. Yeah, I'll pitch, you know, every Friday, tomorrow at 10, every Friday at 10 o'clock, I do an Alder Talk Live. And it's really a whole group of different people. And we've got law clerks, we've got law students, we've got lawyers of all ages, we've got non-lawyers on it. We talk about a lot of different things and I've had people that meet each other there. You know, if you see, here's another example, just, you know, I was president of the, the LA Trial Lawyers Charities and somebody said, how do I get to you? I'm like, well, did you know I was a president of LA TLC? Yeah. Did you volunteer at anything and come say hi? Oh, I could do that? Hell yeah, you can do it. Think outside the box, get out your comfort zone and do it. Any of us have interest. Do you hear that beautiful Spanish accent that, that uh, Mr. Dolan has? Did you know he, he lived in Spain? Oh, maybe I know something now about Chris. Maybe I can do whatever. There's, you know, 
you know, Mike is a president of CAOC. Show that that means something to you. That you know, there's a lot of stuff. Just think about it. It requires the work, but if you do it, you can stand out because not a lot of people do it. Yeah, and I, I personally, I love law and motion. So when I was in law school, I loved doing the research and getting a chance to do motions, doing our LRW class. When I, when I left law school, I would read trial court orders all the time just so I can have a better understanding of how these motions are being ruled. And when I started sending out resumes, I actually attached mock motions that I did to my resumes to try to kind of stand out. So while you're in law school, if you can figure out some area of law that you like, whether it's trial advocacy or, or motion writing or, you know, doing complaints or doing discovery and you're sending out these resumes, it doesn't hurt to add a writing sample of something that's different than your ordinary LRW assignment, something like a copy of a complaint that you did. Uh, just a draft one doesn't have to be real case, some discovery that you've done, um, sh showing the, the employer that you know your evidence codes and your objections and listing some stuff and some discovery that you've done and um, stuff like that can really help you stand out because we're also looking for practical skills among your personality, your devotion, dedication. If you can show to us that you, you've done some discovery, you've done some motions, you've done research, stuff like that really can help stand out. The only thing that I'll add is um, be aware of when someone is trying to help you. Um, I uh, have found on occasion, for example, right now, the people who just graduated may be able to take the bar in October. I had people who had just graduated from law school apply for associate positions. And there were a couple that seemed really interesting. So I reached out to say, maybe you'd want to be a law clerk, or we also have every once in a while what we call a staff attorney, which is essentially a um, non-exempt research and writing position that you can you know, be a lawyer, you're not making any uh, court appearances, you don't need your ticket yet, but you can have that position too. And it was interesting how resistant some folks were and they said, no, I want the associate position. I said, well, you don't have a bar number yet. <laughs> so if people are um, extending an olive branch and trying to figure out how to help you get your foot in the door, recognize it for what it is. And again, it gets back to, are you humble enough to do whatever it takes, like Mike Alder taking a job without knowing uh, whether he's making minimum wage or not, um, it, it, it shows. I also would caution, um, you know, use common sense and think of professionalism when you're trying to stand out. I have had a lot of people for some reason, I don't know if this is a trend right now, um, it's not one that I would get behind, um, do uh, little videos and send the video of themselves uh, with an application. I've also seen a lot of resumes with photos of people that look like they're just taken from their Facebook profile. Um, and not really professional shots. So, you know, think about uh, if, in small trial firms, everyone is forward facing. Everyone has interaction with the clients and with the public, with vendors. Um, so think about the impression that you might be leaving when you are trying to be creative. And so don't be Elle Woods trying to apply to Harvard. <laughs> it, that was exactly, exactly <laughs> my thought. Is this a scratch and sniff resume? You know, <laughs> but yeah, don't be Elle Woods. Well, everybody, it's one o'clock and we have to wrap things up. I want to thank all the participants for their great knowledge. You've had a lot of great advice. Hungry and humble, be prepared, think outside of the box. Just a few thoughts. The is any further information, you can go to the chat. They got websites and emails. And again, everybody have a great day and thanks for all the great knowledge. Good. And I miss all you guys. I hope we can all get together soon. Because I mean, the other thing I'll tell you is trial lawyers are a tribe. And right now our tribe has not been able to gather. So, but I miss you guys dearly. So take good care of you. All right, good luck guys. Everyone pass that bar. All right, see you guys.